about your background, uh, where you're born, where you're raised, and just kind of what you know life was like as a, as a kid, that sort of thing. Okay, well, I was born and raised in Park Slope, which is Brooklyn, New York. Um, my parents and I lived with my paternal grandparents in a brownstone. I was very happy for the, be- for the first 10 years of my life, but they ma- basically raised me. Um, my grandparents were very religious Catholic people. Mm. Uh, so I went to church six days a week. I went to Catholic school for the first three years. And um, it was rough because growing up, my grandparents were my parents, in my opinion, because my parents didn't care for me. Mm. Um, My grandparents were the ones that took care of me. They took me everywhere. They bought me all my necessities, clothes. If I was sick, it was them that was always there. Did you live with them as a child? Yes. For the first 10 years, I lived with them in a brownstone with my parents. My parents divorced when I was seven, and my grandparents didn't want me to leave, so they allowed us to stay, even though my parents were divorced because they didn't want to lose me. And my mother remarried, had another baby through her second marriage, and I was already 10 going on 11, and... My grandmother had enough, and it hurt her, but she she was selling the house anyway to move upstate. So she asked if she asked my mom uh, to find an apartment, which she did. Once we moved out, my mother and my stepfather forbid me to see my grandparents. Did you but, move far away from No, Bensonhurst. Parcel? Okay. 13th Avenue we lived. And that's just a few, a few like two neighborhoods south for folks that may not know. Yeah. Yes. So it's not, you know. Um, they forbid me to see them, talk to them. But my my grandfather's sister, my great aunt, owned an apartment building half a block from where we moved. So I would go to her house and talk to them. They would mail her a check so I would have money because I got nothing from my mother, my mm. stepfather. Uh they had two more kids after that, so there was two adults and three children and a Rottweiler living in a small one-bedroom apartment. We slept in a living room. Um, it was it was rough. I mean, I don't remember two of my sisters because after I buried my son, I had five strokes. So one of my sisters, I know she passed away, and the other one... I tried to get to know, but she has a lot of problems, and I try to help, but she's not stable, or she doesn't really want the help. I don't want to make it sound like she's a bad person, because she's probably not, but I don't remember her Mm. like that, so... And you're the eldest? You're the... Yes. Okay. And two sisters? Three. Three sisters. There was three. One of them passed uh, from COVID. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, she was the baby. Um, I was told I was 17 years old than her. She passed right uh, four months into COVID. Mm. But she was born with a very rare disease uh, called prader willi syndrome. So I looked into that, too. That's uh, very rare <laughs> to have that. That's a disease that um, it's... You don't have long life. Mm -hmm. Um, You, your body doesn't develop the way a normal woman's body would. Uh, It's it's an eating disorder. Like they say that most people that have this, they they'll eat until their stomach explodes and. 99% 99% of the time they pass with a smile on their face because this is what that disease is. Um, it's it's different. I mean, everybody is born one way or another. I mean, it's sad. I mean, I don't remember her. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't wish harm on nobody. You know, right, I, I want everybody to be happy and healthy and no fighting and yeah that's just the way I am yeah. I like to be there to help people but 
sometimes you help and help and people just continue to walk on you. Yeah. And, you know, for all the, you know, family dynamics, some certainly, I mean, would you agree? Is it fair to say there's a, uh, an element of family just kind of dysfunction as, 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 as you were uh, being raised? Um, you know, there's for all of that notwithstanding, and we wouldn't wish that on anybody. Uh, help folks who might be watching this just then, who knows, you know, anywhere. Uh, maybe they've never visited, you know, a place like Brooklyn. You know, what's what's it, what's it like being a, a kid in Brooklyn? There's got to be some 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 fun uh, things about that, some challenging things about that. Well, I mean, life today for the kids that are growing up today is very different from when I was growing up. Like mm. when I grew up in Park Slope, um, there was brownstones on the whole block, and, and parents, brownstones for folks who don't know is a particular type of house. Kind of that Cosby show opening scene kind of house. Yes. Beautiful, very scenic, very kind of iconic New York. Yes. And parents, grandparents, everybody was always outside spring, summer, fall. Kids used to run around, play tag, hide and seek, stick ball, wiffle ball, stoop ball. There was always something going on, block parties. Now kids home Mm -hmm. on electronics they don't go out i mean coney island is a very dangerous neighborhood Mm. there's constantly shootings and i mean a few weeks back maybe five or six weeks ago a girl two blocks from me went to the store for her mother 14 years old they still never found her Mm. so i don't allow my daughter to go out on her own because i'm Mm. afraid yeah I mean, I, I lost one child. I, I wouldn't be able to handle losing another. Yeah. And no parent should have to lose their children. It's just, it's not supposed to be that way. Wow. So from from being a, a, a kid raised in a couple of different Brooklyn neighborhoods, uh, as you became a young adult, what did, what did life look like? What did life look like then? You... you uh, you know, did you get married? Did you start working? What? I, I, I started working when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was seven or eight years old. My very first job, I, I helped out in a grocery store on the corner of my block in Park Slope. Um, great family. Um, I used to stock the shelves. Um, I used to sweep them off the floor. I'm a people person, mm-hmm. so I would greet the people coming in. I just always been a people person, outgoing. I like conversating. I like making people laugh, making them smile. I'm the type of person, I may not be financially stable, but if I know taking a shirt off my back is going to help somebody, mm-hmm. I'm the first one to do it. Yeah. Wow. Um, so you, you know, you, you mentioned having a family of your own there, the, uh, at, at what age did you start having kids of your own? I was 19 going on 20 mm-hmm. when I had my son. After my son was born a few years later, um, I had to get emerg- an emergency appendix removal. Mm-hmm. At that time, they noticed one of my ovaries was ruined it had cysts they couldn't save it they didn't think I was going to be able to have any more kids so my daughter 15 years later she was my miracle baby Mm. because they said I couldn't have any more kids and I was only 22 at the time so that was kind of devastating so when she when I became pregnant with her um I was beyond happy and I love children. How many years later was it? That- 15 years that she was born. Wow. That my kids were 15 years apart. They were both born in July. Oh, wow. She was. She's the ninth. He was the 31st. And the special thing about my son is he was born on my grandfather's birthday, mm-hmm. my paternal grandfather, who was my father. Yeah. So um, that was a blessing to me. And my son's middle name I named after my grandfather. Mm. So his name was Michelangelo. Wow. Um, I love my kids. I mean, I didn't 
put them off to other people to watch them. Where a lot of young people that have children young, I was very mature for my age mm -hmm. because I raised kids from the age of 10 on. Yeah. Um, my mother wasn't a good mother. Um, so I, I, I was more mature than a normal 19 year old would be. So I took my responsibility very serious. I'm not going to say that me not being able to participate in things that babies are not allowed to go to didn't bother me. Mm. But I had a baby. I had to be a responsible parent, and that's what I was. Yeah. And uh, your your son's father, uh, did you, you guys knew each other from school, or how did you guys No, know? he's he's seven years older than me, so oh, okay. when we got together, I was 18. He was 24. And he's from from Southern Brooklyn as well? No, he's from Midwood. Okay. We met at a bowling alley um, in Bensonhurst. Mm -hmm. And he knew he he bowled with one of my good friends. And we hit it off and we started dating. And um, it, was, it was nice. I mean, to this day, even though we haven't been together in 20 years, nearly 28 years, 29 years, I have a very special relationship with a lot of his brothers mm. and his sisters. So um, it's special. His mom, yeah. his dad who passed away um, in March, will be two years ago. Um, I was very close to all of them. I had my own special relationship. And even his his. Um, <clears throat> extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles. I get along with all of them to this day. Yeah. So um, it's nice because I like to see families that are close. Sure. Um, it makes me happy because I didn't have that. So I like to see people close together, close-knit families, families that do things together, um, happiness, People that are there for each other, that stuff makes me happy. Yeah. When when you guys got together and uh, when were, were you married when you found out your son was coming along? Or did you guys ever marry? Or We never married. I married my son, my daughter's father. Mm. That was, uh, that was uh, not a good thing. So you, um, once your son came along, how long were you and his father uh, together? We weren't together long after that because he was the type of person that he would push me away and say, we're not together, move on with your life. Mm. And I tried for two years, and you get to a point where you get tired of hearing it. So you were you were a single mom, really, from yeah. the start. Yeah. Yeah, and then you, you meet your uh, the man who would become your yeah. daughter's father. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some years later, I'm yes. assuming. Yeah. So you're on your own for a long time. Um, and then you did marry. Yeah. How long were you married? Um, two or three years, but the first six months were okay. And mm -hmm. then everything went to garbage. Oh, no. It was, it was pretty bad. Um, very abusive, very... Um, Mentally and physically, it was abusive. And I'm a good person. I mean, before I got sick, I mean, even to this day, I cook every day. Mm. Very seldom do I get outside food. Yeah, I always been that way. My grandparents taught me to be that way, and I'm grateful to them. I mean, my, grand, my grandfather died in 99. He was 97 years old. My grandmother died in 2003. She was 87. Mm. My grandparents were 12 years apart. And um, I learned a lot from them. I mean, I'm the person I am today because of them. Yeah. Nobody else just, they were just the best people ever. And I was so blessed to have them in my life for nearly 30, 30 years. My grandmother, 27 years, my grandfather. Mm. It's very seldom you see a person have grandparents to the age of 30. Yeah. And I have cousins that are 7, 10, 13 years older than me. Mm -hmm. So they had them, some of them, they were 
almost 40 or in their 40s when they were when my grandpa my grandmother died wow yeah that's a blessing yeah so your your daughter's born here in brooklyn as well yes um and uh what what neighborhood were you guys living in at that time coney island okay so what brought you to, to coney island well my ex-husband um he lived his mom lived in sheep's head bay mm-hmm. and I met him in Sheep's Head Bay because I used to live over there. And But his apartment was in Manhattan. He had a studio in a Section 8 building in Manhattan. And he moved, we moved to Brooklyn. We got a bed, one-bedroom apartment on um, West 36th and Neptune. Mm, which is Coney Island. Yes. And um, we lived there for about a year and a half. Then we moved... Like every year after that, for like three, two, two or three years, we lived in East New York. We lived in Brownsville. We lived in Queens, and when we were in Queens, that's when we separated. And then I moved to Coney Island. So I've been out here about ten years. Mm. I didn't know that you were in Coney Island prior to that. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you you're in Coney Island for. This time for, for, for 10 years. So what, what brought you back to Coney Island? My son wanted me close because he, he had gotten, he had relapsed with the leukemia. And I moved back here and... You were in Queens and then you moved back? Yeah, for him because he asked me to. I wasn't going to, but because he asked me to, he wanted me close. And wh- where was he at at the time? He was in Midwood because okay. he wa- he didn't want to leave his friends. Mm-hmm. So he asked if he could stay with his dad, mm-hmm. which I was fine with. Um, and he he moved, I moved back in February. In um, March, he went to the hospital to get the bone marrow transplant. But he was at my apartment. Um, where I live now, but when I lived on the 11th floor, um, because he had a port put in, so I had to flush it. I had to give him medication through the port. I had to clean the, I had to give him IV and all these different things through his port. So I learned a lot of medical stuff while he was sick. So when he stayed with me for a couple of nights, I would have to do this Mm -hmm. twice a day. And... It, it was it was hard, but then he went into the hospital to do the bone marrow transplant because they said this time around the chemo wouldn't help. The only way of survival would be through a bone marrow transplant. We got a, a match, and uh, didn't help. Wow. A month after the bone marrow transplant, he started to deteriorate. He got white matter damage to the brain. Um he started not being able to say many words anymore. He was sleeping constantly. And then when he was awake, like I could only see him on weekends because my daughter was in school. But on weekends, his aunt would take her so I could spend two nights with him in the hospital. But when I wasn't there, every night whoever was there, whether it be his paternal grandmother or his dad, they would have to call me because he would wake up screaming, mommy. And the only way he would calm down is if he heard my voice. Mm. It was it was rough. And, and, and how old was he when he became ill? The first time he was uh, 17. Wow. And he died at 23. He was one month prior to being five years in remission. Mm. And they said if, if he made it to five years, he would be in the clear. He didn't make it. When he went to the doctor to do the PET scan, the doctor said his whole body lit up like a Christmas tree. So it it was rough. It was really rough. Wow. So, and I got sick after that. And And, and how many years ago did he pass? In 2015, October 28, 2015. And May of 2018, um, at five strokes, four of them were silent. The last one, I was in ICU for 21 days. They didn't think I was going to make it. And I prayed to God to please help me. Mm -hmm. Please get me my strength because I know I needed to be there for my daughter. Yeah. 
because she didn't have anybody. Well, she's in maybe a junior high school at that time. Yeah, she was in elementary at the time. Oh, wow. She was in elementary. Um, she was graduating. She was graduating. She was in the fifth grade. And um, it was rough. And now she's a junior in high school. Hmm. So she's doing really well in the program that she's in. And I'm a big supporter of her. And I help her with everything she needs. Um, a mom, I'm here when she needs to talk. I make sure she's... I may not have much, but I make sure she has it all. Yeah. Wow. Now, somewhere along the the way, I, I, I'm I trying to remember what year it was, and they all kind of run together. Maybe your memory is better than, than mine. But um, at, at some point, you... You you learned about uh, graffiti and, and 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 we met. What year was that? I'm not sure. I remember what year that was. Was that eighteen or was it? It might have been seventeen or eighteen because it might have been seventeen. Because I know the first time I started taking the GED classes that you were giving. Uh huh. I had to stop for some reason. I don't remember why. Okay. Then when I went back the second time, when I signed up for it the second time. Okay. So you were with, you you were a student twice. Yes. The first time I didn't complete it. Okay. Because I don't remember the reason, but I had to stop coming. Then I had my strokes in 2018, mm. and then I came back, and I got my GED. <laughs> yeah, wow. It's so good. So... Uh, you know, in 2017, um, yeah, if, if that was the year, you know, you, you, you needed a diploma, you needed a GED. How did, how did you hear about, how did you hear about graffiti? Well, I shop a lot in the store that was beneath where you had graffiti at, um, which was Bargainland. Mm. I was always over there and I would see the board you would put out with the GED class and I would see flyers that would be put around and I was like you know let me check it out Mm -hmm. because I I've always I wasn't sure my path you know Mm -hmm. I mean I know I love God and I believe in God and all of the above but certain things about the way I was raised with being Catholic I I was uncertain of what path I needed to be on. So I like In terms to, of faith. You yes. Mean. Yeah. So I like to learn different things and see what makes me feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. And that's what graffiti did. But even back then, you know, one of the things that we try to help people understand is, you know, we, we call um, our approach to ministering to the community meet the need first. And and the and the truth is we we believe everybody, every we we just we know everybody needs a relationship with God through Jesus. Um, everybody is designed to be in community with a local church, but a lot of people, that's just not on their radar. So they may need those things, but they don't know that they need those things. But a lot of people have other needs as well that they're more aware of. And for you at that time, that was a GED. You you knew you needed a GED. You knew that you needed that diploma. And, you know, we're not a Trojan horse. We're not a bait and switch. If the only help that anybody ever wants from us is getting that diploma or tutoring, uh, you know, a child or or whatever the need may be, a, a meal for somebody who's who's hungry, That's okay. We never require people to hear the gospel or to be a part of church in order to have their need met. But we do try to meet those needs with uh, love and sincerity. And and we we just let people know about other opportunities to plug into some other things. And so when you connected with graffiti, you're 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 looking for a GED and we were able to help with that. Talk just a little bit about just what it was like being a GD student for one, and then and then we'll 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 kind of unpack how you um, kind of cross the aisle over into into being a part of church as well. Okay, well, 
when when I signed up to be in the GED program, I was nervous because I had attempted to take the test many many years ago, but at the time I was working in a place and they always seemed to have the test at Kingsborough during a Jewish holiday time. And my bosses being, they were Jewish. I was able to go the first day, but they wouldn't let me go the second day. So you don't go, you don't pass. Mm -hmm. Um, When I was a kid and I went, when I was 17, um, I failed the math. Mm. So I was very nervous when I joined the the classes that you gave for the GED because I struggle with algebra. That was a subject I can never do. And at the time you had Pastor Matt with you and between you and Pastor Matt and um, that one girl that started becoming the math teacher, she was very good as well. But between the three of you and Nobody had to be afraid if they didn't understand, they could see you after or during class while everybody was doing whatever they were doing for that uh, subject. And you would go over it, or Pastor Matt would go over it, or the young lady that was teaching us the math would go over it with us and explain it where we understood. Mm -hmm. So I would write everything down. I would go home and I would study it. Because I'm a person that I like to learn. Mm-hmm. I like to learn. I I love certain things more than others. I mean, math, I'm not too big on math <laughs> because I'm not good at it. I mean, I used to be. But the way that it's taught nowadays with this common core, I don't understand it at all. But I learned it. I passed. I got my GED. I was very happy and grateful and thankful. But graffiti also showed me, you know, I, I, I seen a lot and I learned a lot. Like you used to do hot meals. Mm. And then I started coming to help you serve them. And just seeing the happiness on people's faces that you graffiti was so generous to give them something to eat. And I could see the blessing that it was to them. And being able to help serve them was a blessing to me because it, it touched my heart and it made me happy. And it made me think mm. that made me this is the route that I needed to be on because this is where I felt happy. And if you're going to follow something, you got to be happy doing it. Mm-hmm. You can't do it because you're being forced or do it because that's how you were raised. Um, I had a lot of issues with growing up Catholic because you're not supposed to ask a priest a question. Mm. And if you're unsure of something, my opinion is, as you do, if I come to you and I ask you a question and you have the answer, you'll take out your Bible and you'll open up the Bible to wherever it says it in the Bible. And you'll say, here is where it says it. And you'll read it. And then you'll explain it further if I don't understand something. Or if you if you don't know, you'll, it, you'll tell me, well, let me look further into this and I'll get back to you. But for the most part, 99.9% of the time, you always have the answers and they're always correct. And they're in the Bible, mm. which means they're facts. It's not fiction. It's not something made up. It's not something that can be changed. And that was the problem that I had. I Everything has changed. Like in the Bible, you know, you do the gospel, reading of the gospels five days a week. You post it on YouTube. And every day I watch it. If I fall behind a day or two, by the end of the weekend, I'm always caught up. Right now I'm caught up. I'm up to date with everything. But in Matthew, we read about John the Baptist baptizing people, baptizing Mm -hmm. Jesus. They were adults. I didn't see any kids getting baptized, Mm -hmm. any babies getting baptized. And when I questioned a priest or when I questioned somebody about it recently, they gave me a story and I, I asked them, can you show me where it says that in the Bible? Mm. 
and they get mad. Yeah. So I was like, all right, everybody's going to believe the way they want to believe. I like the way I'm believing better because there's proof of all of it. And I don't have to be unsure. I don't have to doubt it. I just know because you'll show me mm. if I don't know something, which is I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for the gospel that you do every day and the little sermon you give after it and talking about before it, the sub chapters and whatnot. It's it's a blessing, and there's so many people would love what you're doing mm. if they want to hear it, but you can't force people to want to. They have to want to do it on their own, but it's truly a blessing. So, so one of the ways, I mean, you it, it's so fun to, to remember. I mean, that's so many years ago now, and uh, I didn't even remember that you were a student twice. <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> Um, but, uh, I, I, I do remember you. I remember a couple of things. I remember you always being the first student there to class and just, just eager and motivated and working really hard. And that hard work paid off obviously, cause you, you, you did finally earn your GED. Um, I remember you coming and helping serve meals. And so there's just been kind of this organic, um, you know, process over the years where you've gone from that person that's not looking for a church to be a part of, but but knows, hey, I, I need my diploma. I've got goals. I want to better outcomes for myself and my, my daughter and these different things. Yes. To see that person going from, hey, I just need this particular need met to now today, you know, somebody who's not only uh, heavily involved in church, but, 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 but as a leader in the church and just involved in so many different areas of ministry, um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit uh, just about what that's like. And, 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 and in particular, maybe start here. You know, you said people need to want to be a part of something. Um, one of the ways that you're uh, blessing the community and serving is being a part of, of outreach and, and evangelism and, 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 and going out and showing people that there is something that uh, that God has for them. You know, talk just a little bit about that and just the different stuff that you're involved in at church. Okay, well, going to do the outreach really made me feel happy because we go by the HRA office, and as you always say, people don't want to be there. They mm -hmm. don't want to hear that their paperwork is lost. They don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear that. So we've done a couple of different ones. We've done donuts, mm -hmm. and then we've done the little bags with the hot chocolate and the candy cane right before Christmas. And people's reaction when they see, well, we're just trying to make your day a little brighter. We know you're going to go in there and deal with some nonsense, and we're hoping to put a little smile on your face. And you get that. Mm -hmm. And people, they're like in shock that people can be nice because... The area of Coney Island, there's not many nice people, and it's very sad. I mean, if more people helped each other, it would be such a different community. If there was no guns and no drugs and no constant bickering and fighting and who's in a gang and who's not in a gang, it's, it's, it's completely unnecessary. It's such, there's so much other things that people can do to make somebody happy. I mean, you walk down the street. If you say hi to somebody, they act like they're in shock. Like if you, it, why did this person say hello to me? I'm outgoing. Mm -hmm. If I'm walking down the street and somebody smiles, I'm going to say, hi, how are you? Yeah. You know, I'm going to make conversation. I'm not racist. I don't care what a person's color, what a be what beliefs they have, what nationality, what kind of faith they follow. I'm going to show people the same respect they show me. If somebody smiles and say hello, I'm going to smile and say hello back. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where that goes. Now, as far as um, my participation in church services... Um, which is also a really amazing thing for me. I greet people. I'll, I'll introduce 
whoever's leading worship. I'll give announcements. I'll say the first prayer. Um, I make sure that every everybody's happy. Anybody walks in, I acknowledge them. I don't want anybody to feel like they're not welcome because everybody's welcome. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to dress a certain way. You come just the way you are and nobody judges you. And it, it's, it's a beautiful time that people spend together worshiping and giving thanks to the Lord. Yeah. And... It's it's truly amazing. I mean, even to even now, and we're a couple of months into graffiti, um, doing its services at the lighthouse, and I still get a little nervous. But you know, once I start to talk, and people they know my name, and mm. they know that if they need anything, I make it clear. You want a friend. You want somebody to call? I'll give you my phone number. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just somebody to vent to, somebody just to check on you and say, hey, how are you feeling today? You know, I'm just that type of person. And I like to make people happy. I like to help people and, and just do right. And seeing people happy, it blesses my heart. Yeah. So that's what I enjoy doing. So I'm going to continue. <laughs> it's so good. You know, one of the one of the questions that we sometimes get um, from people is why, you know, Brooklyn, Brooklyn's nickname for, for many generations was the borough of churches. And, you know, why, why put another church in what has long been known as the the borough of churches, and in, even in Coney Island in particular, you know, there's there are several churches in Coney Island, and so sometimes people ask, well, well, why, why graffiti? Why why put another church in in, in, in Coney Island? And um, you know, from my perspective, we're just trying to do things a little bit differently. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's Coney Island need another church? Or? Yes, Coney Island needs graffiti. Because graffiti doesn't force you to do anything. It doesn't give you pamphlets and it doesn't it doesn't tell you false things. It, everything that graffiti stands for, the love and caring that you and your family bring to this community is something that's very well needed. Because a lot of the churches, they don't care. You and your family are loving, caring caring people who genuinely care about bringing people together to worship the Lord and bringing people together as a place to go to just get to know each other and be there for each other. So, yes, graffiti is needed in this community. Wow. Um, something else that, that sometimes people don't understand is just you know what it's what it's like in this uh, in this community, right? So Coney Island, you know, it's a Brooklyn neighborhood, um, but it's you know, well, I mean, it's a certain type of neighborhood. What just so people can get a sense of the reality and some of the challenges, just talk a little more about Coney Island in particular, and especially what it's like to 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 raise a to raise a a child in Coney Island. Well, for a little, for a couple of years, Coney Island, the crime rate had went down a bit. I mean, you have uh, Coney Island's famous for Nathan's hot dogs. They're famous for the rides. It used to be called Astro and now it's called Luna Park. Uh, the Wonder Wheel, Big Ferris Wheel. Um, it's a uh, small little little area surrounded by water. It, now it's the danger is coming back, the guns, kidnappings, robberies, stabbings. It, it's rough. You have to be afraid, especially being a single mom. It's just me and my daughter. It's scary. You know, I I put a second lock on my door I'm, I'm in this apartment about two and a half years now. 
I paid and put a second lock, a, a second deadbolt because, you know, there's a lot of drug dealing. There's a lot of people walking through the hallways in the middle of the night. I had one night I fell asleep on my couch and somebody kicked my door. It sounded like they hit it with a bat. My heart was pounding out of my chest. My daughter came out the room crying. And this is about a year ago. And it, it's scary. You know, it, it's not... It doesn't have to be this way. If people would just stay away from the drugs and the violence and and be more courteous and loving toward each other. This community could change and be such a great place. I mean, there's so many, there's so much homeless people in the world, especially in Brooklyn. You go on the boardwalk, the Coney Island boardwalk, you see hundreds of homeless people. It's freezing 20 degrees. And you see these people that have to be out there. They have no choice. But they should have a choice. People should want to help. There should be shelter that they can go to that they shouldn't have to be on the street. And it's not like that here. And it's very sad. I mean, if I could, if I could change things... I would make, I mean, they're building all these new apartment buildings. Why can't you take a place like they had a, a roller skating ring on the boardwalk? Why can't they make that a shelter for the winter mm -hmm. for the homeless people? Even if they have to give them sleeping bags, at least they're in a warm place. Yeah. It's very sad. Yeah, a lot of unmet needs in this community is what I hear you saying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, all these things, you know, the drugs, the violence, the heartbreak, the, um, all the damaging outcomes, you know, we, we just believe that the, like you said, if, if things could change, we, we believe the, the answer, we believe the only way things will ever change is, is, is through the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, what else, anything else, uh, that, uh, you know, you want to add or, or share? So thankful for you sharing your story and how you've gone from, um, you know, just a single mom in, in a tough neighborhood who's just looking to earn a diploma to, uh, to not only earning that diploma, but, but also really somebody who's ministering the gospel to the community around her and uh, just a, a big part of making that gospel more available today than it was yesterday. Yeah. Any, anything we've forgotten? Anything else to add? I actually... I'm looking forward to hopefully hosting an alpha class. Oh, that's right. You're becoming a small group leader yes. now, too. <laughs> so um, I've been thinking a lot about it, and um, I want, I'd want i like to make an announcement about that someday, mm -hmm. if you're good with that. Um, and hopefully, even if, even if I start with one or two people, make it like a once-a-week thing in my house, we'll be able to talk to them the way we do when you and Ryan come to see me and um, just make people feel at home, maybe have a little bite to eat and just sit and, and go through the alpha mm. because it's it's really an amazing thing and I think it should be shared. I think people, I think it would bless a lot of people to learn all this stuff and then we can hopefully make leaders out of other people and really start bringing Coney Island to a better place. Mm. Wow, what a what a what an inspiring journey from 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 GED student to to, to Bible study leader and all the go. all the things in between. Praise praise God for that. And uh, Amen. yeah, just we're we're just so proud of you. Thank and. You. Um, just all the things that, that the Lord is doing in your life and, and, and just just the just the the joy that you have that, that we know comes from him. It's 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 just a it's a beautiful thing. It's a special thing. It's a sweet thing. And it's it's something that's influencing a, a lot of other people and we're really we're really thankful for that. So Amen to that. And I just wanna to continue to try to help the best that I can because the joy that it brings to my heart 
to greet people, to be able to pray for people and and just be somebody that can listen if somebody just needs to vent. That makes me feel happy, you know, because yeah. I didn't have that for a long time. And when you left to go to Minnesota, I was very impressed. I missed your family so much, and you came back with two new additions that I had to meet. <laughs> and, um, you know, Pastor Matt, I miss him too. Mm. He, he... He had a very big impact on me as well, and uh, I'm very grateful for, to have met him too. And Kiana, mm-hmm. I was very grateful to have met her. Robert and Lena are amazing people, and God blessed her voice with just an amazing voice. Mm-hmm. She has just, it, it, I get emotional listening to her. Mm-hmm. It just touches my heart so much, so... Yeah, we hopefully I'll be able to inspire people to to want to open up their hearts to the Lord, you know, just let him in. And, you know, it's true what you say. People, it it wouldn't hurt to read the Bible, Mm. not just wait for you to to put the, the gospel thing every day. But there's no reason why somebody can't read the Bible on their own. Yeah. Even if you read a page, a couple of chapters. Got to start somewhere, right? Yes. I mean, I need reading glasses. Otherwise, I would have started already. But I can't read with these. <laughs> so, and especially the words are very small. I, I'd wow. be completely lost. Wow. But. Well, it, you know, I, you know, call me crazy, but I, I just I just think God's at work and. In Southern Brooklyn and Coney Island, what do you think? I agree. <laughs> Amen. Well, listen, thanks for thanks for sharing your story. It's really, really uh, a blessing to us, and I think it's going to be a blessing to a lot of other folks. And you're very welcome.